He's never folding ace queen, it's the nuts. And like I said, in that rare case where we both have the same boat with seven four, he's gonna win the top. And I've learned that lesson. Hey guys, this is Bart Hansen from Crush Live Poker. I wanna show you some things you might not be familiar with with Crush Live Poker. And we have been doing training videos for double board PLO bomb pots the last six months. And I'm gonna continue on with them. A lot of people don't know that we have an extensive collection of training videos for high-low type games. And double board bomb pots or double board VPIP games are a split pot game. And I like to consider myself um, one of the best at split pot games. Over the last six years, I have done tons and tons of training videos on split pot games, whether it be Limit, 08, Pot Limit 08 4 card, Big O, and in the beginning I do a whole intro series on how to play split pot games. So if you like what you see, you want to check it out, there's a coupon code in the description that will get you half off the first month. So in this video, check out a couple of sample hands from my most recent double board PLO bomb pot video. All right, next hand here was a fun one, and it's possible my opponent might have made a mistake, but you will find people sometimes be a little bit overly cautious with their hand reading, especially in these double board bomb pots. So you can see here that I'm in the cutoff and they were deep at 2000 effective and we're seven handed, so the pot's $70. So I have queen eight, seven, four. I mean, it's not going to be something that I'm going to be going nuts on if there's like a bet into me. I just don't have a strong enough high hand. I mean, I probably would call. I do have a couple of back doors going on, you know, obviously up top. And I have three over cards, kickers to 4-3. But it gets checked over to me. So it gets checked over to me. And obviously, I'm going to put in a bet here. And I would like to actually win the pot right now because I have so little chance of winning the high on up on top. I definitely wouldn't mind the folds from flush draws and things like that. And, you know, I don't have the best kicker with my four. And some people who do know what's going on might play a four kind of cautiously. But um, I'm definitely going to bet when it comes over to me. There's a lot of protection type of betting that should go on in split pot games. You know, very similar to Big O. Where sometimes you're just betting to take the pot down. So that's what I do. I bet 50 into, into 70. And I'm going to get a couple of callers here. So the small blind and MP1 both call. Now, these are check callers, right? Not check raisers. These guys check from up front. Obviously, we're going in order. So they did not come out and bet. You know, what could they have? Somebody could have nut spade. Somebody could also have a four here. It's interesting that both of them called. And I also have a four. Also, too, if someone like, you know, when you're ever playing a, a situation like this, and I learned this a lot from Big O, and this is kind of similar to a big O type of spot. Like if you've got three, three here, man, you are just holding on for dear life. And if you had nothing on top, like if I'm MP one here and I had three, three and I had like three, three, seven, eight or some, something like that, no chance to win high. And it goes back call. I am out because I might have the best hand on the bottom right now, but it can just only get works for me. And I have absolutely no way of winning the top. Now, sometimes people get roped into like, whoa, the pot's multi way. I'm making money off of this call. Yeah, on this street, maybe, but your hand's super vulnerable and you're going to be calling pot size bets, you know, down at the end. So I, I thought it was kind of interesting that they both called. And now the pot here is uh, 220. Great card for me on the turn. Now I don't have to worry about someone having like king four or ace four or something like that. I now beat pocket threes. And I continue to have two over cards here as well as I fill up. And there's only one combo of 7-7 seven, seven left. Also, pretty good turn. One of the best turns I can kind of think of up on top. I pick up a flush draw here. And I have a gutter to a 9, which wouldn't really make a great straight because a 9 would put a one-liner out there to a queen, but I don't have a king high straight. I would have a queen high straight with a nine. So anyone with a queen and a copying card like queen jack would have a higher straight than I would with queen eight. But I do have the third knot flush draw, straight flush draw to the nine of hearts. This is a decent, decent little turn for me. And now this guy in the small blind, he's going to come out and lead out here for 150. And I was like, wow, this is really kind of bizarre. Now, players aren't that bad where they're going to lead out here with 5-6 and nothing going on. 
here. So what do I sort of interpret this as? I mean, usually it's some sort of nut hand on one side. Now, I don't think he's got 7-7 seven, seven here. Like I said, I'm not going to be scared of monsters under the bed. He might have 7-4 sort of along with me. And the funny thing about that is I don't have a pair right now up on top. So if he's got 7-4, any pair is beating me right now. But I have a fairly sort of large draw. Or he could have a hand like Ace-Queen of Spades. Or just some sort of Ace-Queen. You know, it doesn't have to be Ace-Queen of Spades. It's just be Ace-Queen with a nut flush draw. Well, I think that that's what a bet like this represents a lot. Or Ace-Queen with hearts, with nut hearts. Some sort of Ace-Queen. With the fact that I'm blocking a lot of the thick, thick value on the bottom board, chances are I thought that this guy had a hand that was high in the form of ace-queen up on top. Way more likely than something strong on the bottom. So he leads for 150. The guy in the middle folds. And now I'm in just in a situation where if I think he's got sort of a nut hand on top, I'm going to pile in as much money as possible here against him because I'm on almost like a stone cold free roll, right? With hearts. If he's got ace queen, I have a heart free roll here. I have a heart free roll. Again, if a nine comes, ace queen, well, ace queen's still going to be the nuts anyways. But if an ace comes, I don't have a straight. I mean, this is just a hearts, right? It's just hearts. Now, if he's got hearts locked up, then there's no way I can win. But he might not have hearts locked up right? I mean, I've got two hearts in my hand. So if he's just got ace queen and I've got a heart draw, I mean, that's nine outs for a free kind of shot at scooping the pot. And the only way that he would ever really have a shot down here is if somehow he had a pair in his hand that could make a full house. Like if he had ace queen nine, nine somehow, and it came a nine at the end at the most two outs, whereas here I've got nine outs. So I'm going to be piling here when I read this hand as him having a high on top. So that's what I do. Go to 500, just under pot. I probably should have just potted it. I don't even know why I went to, to 500. But I go to 500, and he thinks about it for a while, and he finally does make the call. So now we're at 1220, and the river rolls off a 10. So this is what I'm talking about here, like once in a great while. Once in a great while, I'm not going to worry about it heads up. You know, now I'm losing the 8-8 eight, eight, and 5-6 of clubs. But again, you'd have to like literally specifically have to have like ace-queen 5-6 of clubs or ace-queen 8-8. Eight, eight. Plus I have an 8, so there's only one combo of 8 left. Um, I also, again, improve also too if he ever had 7-4 here. I improve and I have a, a better boat because once in a great while here, you can get into these situations like I talked about before, where if we both have 7-4 and I break out here up on top, I don't have anything. So in that rare case where we both have 7-4, he's probably going to win the top if I pot. I'm going to value on myself. But now I'm protected by the 8 because now I beat 7-4. Here's the thing. Let's say this is an offsuit deuce and this is an offsuit 3, where I literally have queen high up on top and he checks. I don't think there's really a reason for me to bet because he's never folding ace queen. It's the nuts. And like I said, in that rare case where we both have the same boat with seven, four, he's going to win the top. And I've learned that lesson. You have to have some backup. If you don't have the absolute nuts on one side, I, I feel like sometimes, I mean, you don't have to have the absolute nuts, but you have to know that you have the best hand on one side in order to make an equity blasting play. And in this particular spot, like I said, maybe 5% of the time, he might have 7-4 along with me. So if it goes brick, brick, and I pot, and he calls with 7-4, he's going to win the top. I'm going to get quartered on my own. And if it's a brick up here, he's never folding ace-queen, so there's no point in me blasting. But now that the board pairs, and I'm protected because I have 8-7 here, now it's balls to the wall. I mean, there's just really no reason for me not to, not to pot here. I mean, the way that this hand played out, it's it's not like he's got 4-3 here. I was going to say once, once in a great while. If he does have 7-4 and I somehow have the best hand here with queen high, I could scoop. But also people, this kind of demonstrates that people will sometimes play very, very cautiously. If he had ace-queen in the board pairs and he has nothing on the bottom, is he going to call to try to win half up here? When he has no chance down here when the board pairs. 
because again, he's going to have to lay a price. If I pot, he's going to call, he's calling 1220 to win 610. So he's got to be right there like two out of three times. So when he checks, I was just like, oh, all kinds of good things happened here for me with that eight protect me. So I go 1220 for pot and he just goes into the tank, goes in the tank and uh, literally like maybe like a minute or two. And then he finally folds ace queen face up. And that's a great example of equity blasting. What's kind of interesting here is that when I bet flop and then raise turn after he leads, I really do fare to have like a strong hand on the bottom here. So a lot of people will make this crying call. And remember, he's laying one to two. So he's got to win half only 66% of the time. So occasionally you do have to kind of make folds sometimes like this. And again, for me to have him, I don't know what his other two cards were, but I don't think he had a pair. But for me to have him like on both sides here, I would have to have working cards. Like I'd have to have a something very strong here and also a boat up top. Because remember, I raised the turn. So that's going to be indicative that I at least have ace queen up here, but more likely I've got a boat down here. And then for him to, in order for him to lose up top, I have to have like a boat and a boat. So seven, four, jack, 10, seven, four, king, 10, you know, something like that. Right. And then of course if I had like seven, four, ace queen. He'd get three quartered, but I'm not sure if I make that fold even for pot, if I'm him here, just the way that that hand played out, but it just goes to show you the power of, uh, of blasting equity, blasting in position. And I won myself, you know, the entire pot by playing aggressively there. Now, finally on to our last hand here. So I get dealt a decent hand, random hand on the button here, almost double suited 10, 10, 9, 8 at 800 effective. And obviously in bomb pots position is huge. So if you ever have the opportunity, uh, no one's paying attention, you know, to skip a bomb pot, do it from out of position. And you always want to be in position. It's just such a huge, huge thing. So seven players, we get these two flops. And obviously, like, I don't really flop much here. I mean, I've got a 10 high spade draw, nothing on the nothing on the bottom. And if anyone had bet, I would just fold here um, no matter what. But that does not happen. It gets checked to me on the button. Um, and I just decide to check it through. Like I said, it's not always that someone's going to... Someone isn't just always betting a king here, although you probably would see a fair amount of kings bet here uh, on this particular board. So six people checked. I mean, <clears throat> there's probably a chance that no one has a king, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to get through everyone either. So, I mean, not flush draw, stuff like that. So I decided to just check and get lucky. And we go to the turn. So the turn is still 70 bucks. And the turn is going to be one of the tens. And it's interesting because it's here on the top. Now, what's the difference between it being on the top and on the bottom? Obviously, if it's on the bottom here, I've got a full house. This is a set of tens, but it is a very, very dynamic wet board where three tens is not going to be the nuts by the river. You know, obviously, if the board pairs, tens full or quads. But remember that whole, you know, Omaha is a form of hold'em, and the lowest nut hand in hold'em, meaning like sharing the cards on the board with your own cards, is three queens. So three jacks is never going to be the nuts. Three tens is never going to be the nuts, and that's because there would be straights out there. So uh, this will not remain the nuts unless it improves um, with pocket tens. Now, it's interesting here that I pick up a gutter to a six on this paired board where no one bet, and then... You know, once in a great while, there's a miracle. There's one out to make tens full, much like some of my other videos. One of the strongest hands that you can have in double board is when you flop two sets or when you have two sets somehow, like if it came 10-10, because it's, and especially if you're playing in a VPIP game, because it is very, very hard to lose both boards. And if you flop, you know, two sets on, on a monotone board on one board and someone's just going buck wild with the nut flush, you're free rolling them because you're going to have them on the other board and you're free rolling them to a full house. So you can't just go buck wild with the nut flush on one board and have nothing on the other two, especially when deep. So this one's interesting here because we're going to see a couple of things happen in front of me. It's still not a super strong hand. And this guy comes out and bets pot. And if there was a raise, I would just fold. 
I mean, if there was a raise to pot, I would just full. I have no, I mean, one out here, down here, right, in this particular spot. And the other thing that's interesting to basic hand rating is that it got checked around the flop. So say somebody raises like in mid position here, they didn't bet the flop. So that would probably mean that it's not on this board here because I've got the three tens that I turned. Uh, it would be most likely something to do with this board. Like someone had king five or, you know, had king seven was slow playing something like that. But even still, uh, it's just very, very hard for me. I think to continue on the board is going to change. I mean, it obviously depends on pot odds and things like that, but you know, rate, you know, bet pot pot, I'm definitely folding. So this guy goes to 70 full pot, which I found interesting from out of position. Cutoff calls. So now the pot is 210 and it's 70 for me to call. So what's interesting here, let's just say that we're drawing dead on the bottom. Now we don't necessarily know that. Again, split pot concept here. I'm calling 70 to win half of 210 here. So it's like 70 to win 105. So it's not like a great price. And then of course the board can change here too. But there are some things that you can do on the button. Like even if the nuts change, like say the river is an offsuit red deuce and some blank down here and it gets checked to me. Well, I'm fairly certain here that 1010 is going to be the best hand, even though 5-3 came in if it was a deuce or something like that. And you can pound somebody. So I decided to make a cautious call. Obviously, I am very, very aware that I have to be careful in this particular spot. So I make the call and now, and everybody else is folded out. So now we're three ways to the river. And can you believe this shit? The river is the case 10. <laughs> so I make running quads. So now I do have the nuts up here and I make a straight down here. Now, obviously, the board is paired, but remember, we saw no bet on the flop, and it was just a big blind bet and call on the turn, and I kind of feel like that mid-position guy, if he was full, like with kings full, king seven, king five, might raise. So it's it's interesting because it's very possible that someone doesn't have a full house down here. And obviously, you know, we've got three players, so this is kind of where it kind of comes into play. Like, what do you want to choose for your sizing? Now, both of these guys check. Now, at this point, I really thought that there was a very good chance that I might scoop here in this spot because I have a lock on the top. And even if somebody didn't have a full house on the bottom, I can see some people calling here with King X in this particular spot, like maybe thinking that I have a 10 or, or, or something like that, especially at this level. Remember, it was kind of a 2-5. It was pretty non-pro game. So when I'm in spots like that, I just pretty much go for, for max value. What's interesting here, though, too, is, is that this is, again, different from, say, for example, you know, the river's a deuce here, where I just think that I'm never going to win the bottom, but I have a lock on the top, and it's three ways, because you can look at this and you're like, well... Do I want to play this as a blast to get unfold kings to fold? Or because there's two people in the hand, do I sort of want to massage it and bet 100 and get two calls to get half too? So it's very sort of intricate at the end. But I make a very strong hand though here that I feel like if I just, I mean, I'm going to decide to bet close to pot or pot that I think when called, I can scoop this a fair amount as played. So... It gets over to me and I pot for 280. So I come over and I pot for 280. And next to act here in the big blind calls and the cutoff player folds. So next to act calls, cutoff player folds. Now, what are the chances that I think that I have a scooper here? I might three quarter. Um, you know, what are the chances that the. Big blind calls here with like an unfull king. He's got to have something on the top though too. And because I am I have four tens, it's kind of hard. You know, maybe he has ace king and he's just kind of hanging on, right? Like ace king, you know, aces and tens with the best kicker and trip king. So I, I think that there's a fair chance I might scoop, but it's not going to surprise me though if, um, if we chop. So the guy calls and we do a reveal here. And this guy hung on for dear life with 5-5. Five, five. It's hard for me to pick up all the cards in my opponent's hand. I just remember from this one, the, the other ones were, I don't know if he had like a 5-high flush. He might have had some low flush draw going on too. But 
as you can see, what he did was he came out and he potted the turn, which was what I was talking about with my hand reading. Like it had to do with this board and it was just that he got a free card. So I don't think anyone really actually had a king. And uh, at the end, he didn't really have anything up here. So he was just hanging on for dear life. And again, this is one of these spots too. I mean, obviously it's four card. It's a little bit less treacherous, but anytime you have an under full in PLO and then in five card PLO, like it, you were just hang, hanging on for dear life as a bluff catcher. And especially if you have nothing on the other side, which he didn't have anything on the other side. And also too, he had a guy behind him. So he called 280 to win half of, it's not, winning half of 560 because this includes my bet he's calling 280 to win half of 280 i'm betting pot so he's calling 280 to win 140 again he's laying one to two he has to be right two out of three times that he at least has the best hand on the bottom he knew he had no hand on top and he has a guy behind him that's a pretty treacherous man that is a pretty treacherous call i mean again the, the way that the hand went down but who knows like i could have king six here or something like that too and he just had i remember he had nothing on the top you know sometimes you can have an emergency where you know okay you've got like five five and and an ace so that if you're wrong down here at least you have a chance to win up here but if you have like five five and nothing else if you're wrong down here you're done pretty much right i mean you're gonna get you're going to get scooped a lot. Although I will say those once in a while, the five, five actually might play for high, uh, in a given situation. So it's slightly better than if, for example, the board was like seven, seven, five, six, and you called with seven, five, and you had no pair in your hand and you had nothing up here, then you're really screwed. You have nothing, but you'd be surprised with these sets that, you know, sometimes the pair in your hand, um, will play. And this is why, you never want to get into a situation in double board where it's set over set and you've got nothing else going on because not only are you going to lose the set over set, but you're going to lose the other board to the higher pair.